Welcome to another lecture on unique and interesting topics in quantum mechanics. This week's lecture is concerning Ehrenfest theorem, which is often confused with the correspondence principle, so I need to talk about both. First, the correspondence principle, which says in general that when you have a new theory, it should work in the regime of an old theory. A case in point would be special relativity. As you slow down particles, the equations of special relativity morph into the equations of classical physics very smoothly. It works well. And in wave mechanics, as we take the quantum number to a very large value, the results correspond to classical physics. This is often illustrated with the harmonic oscillator. If you have a mass on a spring, you got to let's just give it a classical value of 100 grams, a typical omega of one radian per second, angular frequency, an amplitude of one centimeter, you get an energy from that. One half m omega squared a squared is the energy of a classical mechanical harmonic oscillator. If the correspondence theorem makes sense, then taking the expression for the quantum harmonic oscillator's energy in the limit, perhaps, of a large quantum number, we should recover this classical result. I will test this out by equating the mechanical energy, 1 half m omega squared a squared, with the quantum energy and see if the quantum number goes to infinity. So set them equal to each other. n plus a half h bar omega is the quantum energy of a harmonic oscillator. Plug in all of these numbers that are given and solve for n and you get 10 to the 28, which is a very large number. So equating the quantum expression to the classical energy only works if the quantum number goes to infinity, which is essentially a test of the corresponding principle. If you take the energy from that expression, 1 half m omega squared a squared, round the number through, you get 6 times 10 to the minus 6 joules. Compare that to the separation of quantum energy states for harmonic oscillator, which is h bar omega, where in this case omega is 1 radian per second. You have an energy of 6 microjoules and a separation of states of 10 to the minus 34 joules. There are 28 orders of magnitude between the actual energy you're at and the separation between states. You've long arrived at a continuum of states. So the correspondence principle says that wave mechanics is consistent with classical physics when you take it in the limit of large quantum numbers. It's a little different from Ehrenfest theorem. I'll start off first not by telling you what Ehrenfest theorem says, but I'll tell you what it is. It's the result of taking the Heisenberg equation of motion using the momentum operator. So let's talk about the Heisenberg equation of motion. You haven't seen this yet, perhaps. There are two pictures of quantum mechanics. There's the Schrodinger picture of wave mechanics and the Heisenberg picture of matrix mechanics. Our course is conducted mostly in the Schrodinger wave mechanics picture, but we're occasionally confronted with the Heisenberg picture like we are right now. The Schrodinger picture begins with a postulate of Schrodinger's equation. And the Heisenberg picture begins with the postulate of the Heisenberg equation of motion. So these two equations in front of you are the first equation. For example, if our textbook, Griffiths, were written in the Heisenberg picture, then equation one in the book, which is this little one to the right, would have to be replaced with the Heisenberg equation of motion, this one here. And then everything would build from that, and it would be a very different book. What's interesting about that big difference is that the results are the same. For example, expectation values of observables are the same in both the Heisenberg picture and the Schrodinger picture. Let's talk about the features of the Heisenberg equation of motion. You have this time derivative of operator A. A is a generic operator. You have a time derivative of that operator. It equals the commutator of that operator with the Hamiltonian h plus the partial time derivative of that operator. So we need to talk about the difference between a total time derivative and a partial time derivative. It would appear they're not the same thing. The partial time derivative is only non-zero if what is being differentiated explicitly contains time. 
So if the expression for operator A contains inside of it anywhere the letter T, then that partial of A with time is probably non-zero. Otherwise, it's zero. So in the case of the momentum operator, which is minus IH bar D by DX, there's no T anywhere in this expression. And because there's no T anywhere in this expression, this partial is zero. So in a lot of situations, the Heisenberg equation of motion reduces to the time derivative of the observable's operator equals the commutator of that observable, the Hamiltonian period, as is the case with momentum. So we're going to replace A with momentum, and we're going to throw out the partial derivative of momentum with time, and we will evaluate the commutator of momentum with Hamiltonian. That's the next step. You may have done that before, in which case you can skip ahead, but let's look at the commutator. So the typical way to evaluate a commutator is to inspect how it acts on a function. In this case, we'll say a function of x because p is d by dx. So momentum only cares about x, which means if we're going to evaluate the commutator of momentum with anything, we have to evaluate it on a function that contains x. So replace the Hamiltonian with the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger equation. You know, that's kinetic energy, and that's the potential energy. That is what the Hamiltonian is. And the momentum operator. And I'll make a little simplification here based on an observation. That commutator is simplifies down to that on account of the fact that different orders of derivative commute. So d by dx commutes with the second d by dx there will be no commutator between the momentum operator and the kinetic energy operator. So we only have to find the commutator between the momentum operator and the potential energy. Expand out that commutator, and there's a product rule that has to be applied to the first term. Apply that product rule, and you realize, oh, the second two terms are equal and opposite. They cancel, and you're left with an expression for the commutator of momentum with the Hamiltonian and we'll take that expression on with us. 1 over i h bar times the commutator momentum with h is minus dv by dx. So we'll use that in our work going forward. Next step is to find the expectation value of this equation. And the reason why we're doing that is because we want to look at what happens in the classical limit. And the classical limit doesn't really know anything about quantum mechanical states. So let's take the expectation values of these, this expression. And you do that by sandwiching that equation between two state vectors. We had to put a bra and a ket around each term in this equation. So we put the bra and the ket around the dp by dt and surround the commutator with the bra, bra and a ket. And so we have this expression that the expectation value of dp by dt is the expectation value of 1 over ih bar times the commutator. Now I'm going to do something that might seem awkward to you. I am going to rewrite the expectation value of momentum by pulling the time derivative out. Now if you're uncomfortable with doing that, as you should be, you should probably evaluate those two ways of looking at this and see that they're the same or whether or not they're the same. So I'm going to do that first by looking at the time derivative of the expectation value of momentum. Write it out more explicitly, the time derivative of what's expectation value, but a state vector in bra form, the, the operator, and a state vector in ket form. Momentum does not contain the letter T. So even though the state vectors themselves might be time dependent, momentum does nothing to that time dependence. And furthermore, knowing that wave functions time dependence comes in the form of e to the minus i omega t, we'll have in the ket side, on the right side, e to the minus i omega t, and over on the bra side where you have the complex conjugate, well, e to the i omega t, they annihilate. The time dependence cancels before you even take the integral that is involved in an expectation value. So this d by dt never gets the opportunity to do anything to the time that's inside of here. So you may as well evaluate that expectation value at time equals zero. 
Let's rewrite it as the state vectors at time equals zero, knowing that the e to the i omega t is canceled. That allows the d by dt to slide past the first state vector and then hits the momentum operator and it'll do nothing to the second state vector. So the only thing in here that could possibly be responding to d by dt is p. So just let it park right there on the dp by dt and I'll write it in simplified form, the expectation value of dp by dt which can be evaluated with the state vectors at time equals zero. So now I have justification for pulling the d by dt out of the expectation value expression. So I'll rewrite it this way then. First I pulled out the d by dt. While I'm at it I replace 1 over ih bar commutator with minus dv by dx where v is potential energy. This looks like something doesn't it? p is momentum. In classical physics, we talk about the time derivative of momentum, Newton's second law, as being force. We don't talk much about force in quantum mechanics. And that's because force is really an artificial construct. What force really is, is the gradient of potential energy. And that's why we make a point of teaching that in first semester physics, that force is minus the gradient of V, or at least minus dV by dx. So force being minus the gradient of potential energy means that what's on the right-hand side of this expression is force. So you have this statement that the time derivative of momentum is force, because force is minus the gradient of potential energy. But the time derivative of the expectation value of momentum is the expectation value of force. The reason why it says almost Newton's second law is because classical physics has no concept of an expectation value. So what's the meaning of an expectation value to a classical physicist? Is it average value? Well, the problem there is that the average value is not necessarily the expectation value. Think about a mass on a spring. The mass is oscillating up and down, up and down. The average value of the force on that mass is zero because half the time the force is going one way and half the time it's going the other way. So this is not the same thing as the value averaged over time. So that's why I have the word almost there. And that's as good as it gets with Aaron-Fest theorem. You almost recover Newton's second law, but you, you recover the form of Newton's second law. An important observation that I would make also is that the Planck's constant is gone, which is really important. In order to have a classical physics expression, you have to be rid of Planck's constant. Classical physics does not know Planck's constant. It has no use for it. And so fortunately, it's gone from that expression. Now I want to get a, a more general expression by going back to the Heisenberg equation of motion and putting the bra and the ket around it, so you have the general operator A, and having that statement, and that's a more general statement of Aaron-Fest theorem. That's not how it's typically put. It's normally said with momentum, and it's normally talked about in the context of momentum. When this is published, it's actually referred to in this form also as Heisenberg's equation of motion with uh, expectation values. Let's use this form to show that momentum divided by mass actually is velocity. What is velocity? Well, if you take the expectation value of position and differentiate it with time, you have the velocity. Because if I have a, a particle moving with a certain velocity, I have an expectation value for where it is. That's where the wave group has its largest amplitude. And so wherever that's moving, that's the velocity. And so we'll take the time derivative of the expectation value of x to find velocity. Let's do this with operator A equal to the position operator. Let's evaluate this Heisenberg equation motion then with x the position operator. You have this partial derivative of x which doesn't have t in it. It's x, it's not t. So there's no t in x. So the partial derivative of x is 0. We need simply to evaluate the commutator of the position operator with the Hamiltonian. You may have done this before. I just did the momentum with the Hamiltonian. I'm not really inclined to 
spend time right now doing, I should leave some exercise for you, the reader. But there is the commutator of position with the Hamiltonian. It's I h bar over mass times the momentum operator. Let's use that going forward. You can go ahead and pause and study the screen if you wish to. So replacing the commutator of x and Hamiltonian with I h bar over m times momentum, the time derivative of the expectation value of x is I over h bar times the expectation value of I h bar over m momentum. Cancel the i's and the h bars and you have d x by dt is the expectation value of p over m. Now that looks like velocity equals momentum over mass. So the classical expression is recovered when you take expectation values. That's how I would articulate Ehrenfest theorem then. I'd say that the time evolution of expectation values of quantum mechanical operators, so dx by dt, matches the classical results, such as Newton's laws. I mean, we have dp by dt and dx by dt, and they both look like Newton's laws. Another way that Ehrenfest theorem is commonly stated is that after many repeated measurements, the average value of observables will follow classical laws. I gravitate towards the number one. So that's Ehrenfest theorem, in particular the statement that the time derivative of the expectation value of momentum is the expectation value of minus the gradient of potential energy. And that's the crux of Ehrenfest theorem. But as you can see, it's bigger than that with velocity and momentum and in general with the Heisenberg equation of motion.